Good morning to everyone who remembered to change their clocks. <laughs> Welcome to worship on the second Sunday in Lent. Just a couple of announcements to, to make to remind you about the uh, midweek Lenten conversations. The first one is at Zoom in the morning, and then there's one at noon, and another one in the evening. So a time slot for everyone. I would also uh, note that the fellowship forum will be not next week, but the week after, because because of Lenten schedule, the council couldn't meet on its usual Wednesday, so the council's meeting on the next Thursday, so everything gets shifted a little. So if, you look, if you've got the fellowship forum on your calendar, make sure it's for two weeks from today and not next week. And we have an uh, announcement about the transition team. our transition team uh, conversations with you. These groups are gonna help us know what to put on our site profile that will help us to create the, mass, the match that'll be best for our new pastor when we call him or her. Um, there will be more than just one meeting probably for most of you and um, each meeting will have a different focus. We've done our best to honor your requests on how you would like to participate in the group and what time of day works best for you. We, like you, are anxious to continue the process. If you haven't completed a survey, please do so, and a, a transition team member will contact you with your meeting time. There's two handouts today to pick up in the, mar in the, in the North X. Huh. Can't do that when you have a mask on. One is pink and one is purple. And these will give you some guidelines as to how we're going to conduct our conversations. So we look forward to hearing with you all your ideas. Thank you. Any other announcements that I have forgotten? All right, we're ready. <laughs> Please join us in worship, come unto me.
time I invite you to greet one another still not moving around we're still in COVID precautions <laughs> all the folks at home <laughs> we begin our worship with the confession and forgiveness if you have your rock with you I invite you to Take it out and let it remind you of the weight of sin. In the name of God, who makes a way in the wilderness, walks with us, and guides us in our pilgrimage. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love and help us to love our neighbors. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God of the covenant, in the mystery of the cross, you promise everlasting life to the world. Gather all peoples into your arms and shelter us with your mercy, that we may rejoice in the life we share in your Son. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Yes. 
side in his love we hide all the day through when you get discouraged just remember what to do reach out to jesus he's reaching out to you is the light you're living filled with sorrow and despair? Does the future press you with its worry and its care? Are you tired and friendless? Have you almost lost your way? Jesus will help you just call on him today. Today's reading is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through chapter 4, verse 1. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. The word of the Lord. Please rise for the gospel reading. The Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look. Your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of our Lord. Thank you. you may be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God our rock and our redeemer, amen. 
So we're in the, we are in the second Sunday in Lent, continuing on our Lenten journey. And in today's gospel text, we see Jesus on his journey. And what's happening here in this text is that some Pharisees come up to Jesus and they give him a warning that Herod wants to kill him. Now, usually when we see the Pharisees enter the picture, our automatic default is, ah, here come the bad guys. But it is important to remember that the Pharisees were people of good intention. They wanted to do what would be pleasing to God. Now, they got off track because they thought what was pleasing to God was to keep the law in all of its details, and they got wrapped up and all of the details, and they missed the heart and core of the law. But they had good intentions. So I really believe that when they came to Jesus on this occasion to warn him about Herod, it was because they were worried about the well-being of Jesus. Now you will get other pastors who disagree with this. I've heard some things from other pastors who have a different opinion. And we all know it's our own opinion, our own interpretation. But let's think about that as the Pharisees wanting to warn Jesus. Things are getting dangerous for Jesus. He's getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. And the Pharisees are worried. They don't want Herod to kill Jesus. They don't want that kind of disruption. So they give that warning. And Jesus responds with a task for the Pharisees. Go to Herod, if you're worried about Herod, you go to Herod and tell that fox that I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. I am going to keep driving out evil spirits. I am going to keep healing people. Today and tomorrow, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. Today and tomorrow and on the third day. And now to our ears, we immediately jumped to the resurrection on the third day from the death of his of, on the cross. But of course, that's not what, it would, what would have leapt to mind for the Pharisees. How would they have heard this phrase from Jesus about today and tomorrow and on the third day? And I never asked myself that question before. That's what happens when you start looking at scripture. It always comes up with new questions for you. So I went on a little hunt. And I found myself in the book of Exodus being surprised. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and prepare for the third day. Because on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. I was looking for phrases using the third day and I stumble into something that has the exact today and tomorrow and on the third day. And it's fair to assume that the Pharisees were so deeply embedded in scripture, particularly anything to do with Moses, that they would instantly have recognized this. Today and tomorrow, Moses was to prepare the people, to consecrate the people today and tomorrow. And then on the third day, that's when God would meet with Moses on Mount Sinai to give Moses the law. On the third day. The people of Israel had escaped from slavery in Egypt they had crossed the Red Sea. They were wandering around in the wilderness. They found themselves at the base of Mount Sinai, wondering what was going to happen next. What was their future going to be? And they get this moment in time when there's a shift. 
Today and tomorrow, consecrate yourselves and prepare. And on the third day, God is going to meet with Moses. And a new thing will begin. The ex-slaves will begin to become formed into the nation of Israel, following the directions that God has given, the law of God that was designed to help people know how to live together in love and care. On the third day, this earth-shaking moment, and it literally was an earth-shaking moment if you go on to read in Exodus. On that third day, there was thunder and lightnings and the earth shook and a cloud engulfed the top of the mountain where Moses was meeting with God. The third day was something special. So Jesus tells the Pharisees, go say this to Herod, I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing today and tomorrow, I'm gonna keep casting out demons and healing people, and on the third day, my goal will be fulfilled. And after I found that section in Exodus, my sermon took a completely different direction than I thought it was going to. Here we are. This idea of what work that Jesus was doing on his way to Jerusalem, that it was consecrating the people, this work of casting out demons and healing people, of interacting with people on his way to Jerusalem. He was consecrating them, getting them ready for what was going to happen next for this earth-shaking change. And yet, although it is going to be a change, it's linked to the past, because then Jesus starts talking about how important Jerusalem is. Jerusalem was central to everything in the worship life of the people of Israel. And Jesus is going to Jerusalem because that is where the people are used to God meeting them. And then Jesus starts talking about the prophets. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I longed to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the place that stones the prophets that kills those that are sent to you. Jesus is in lament. He laments all the things that have gotten in the people's way. He laments how the people did not listen to the prophets, but rather killed them. And I don't believe that Jesus was lamenting what he was about to face, but rather that grief of the brokenness of the people who keep getting in the way of God's love. This lament from Jesus is an expression of love. How often have I longed to gather you the way a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you would not. People consistently get in the way of God's deep love. And sometimes with the best of intentions. The Pharisees didn't want Jesus to go on to Jerusalem for that third day. And I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that it was with the best of intentions. But yet, it was getting in the way of God's love. It's so easy for us to get in the way of God's love. With the Pharisees, they were afraid. They were either afraid that Jesus would be killed and they did not want Jesus to be killed, or they were just afraid of the disruption that that would cause for Herod to put yet someone else who was popular to death 
the way he had killed John the Baptist. But whatever the reason, they were afraid and they were anxious. And I think that's what often gets in the way of God's love. Those are the barriers that we put up. We get afraid, we get anxious. And instead of opening ourselves to God's love, to God's cleansing, we draw in on ourselves. Sometimes what it is is that we're afraid of disruption. We're afraid of conflict. So we avoid things that might be controversial. We tiptoe around things. So we want everything to be calm. And in the words of Jesus to the, Pharisee, to the Pharisees, go and tell that fox that I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Jesus did not mind making waves. Jesus was going to continue to cast out demons and to heal people, which meant that crowds were going to continue to form around him. He was going to continue to do his healing work no matter how disruptive that might be. And he knew that going to Jerusalem would just make things even more disrupted. But he set his face to Jerusalem to go to the cross out of the depth of God's love for us. It's so easy for us to draw in on ourselves in fear and anxiety and want to protect ourselves. And we forget about how we are called to love and that loving and caring for those who are oppressed, who are on the margins, who are in need, is going to be disruptive to our comfortable lives. It is a challenge. But in that midst of that challenge, we have the image of, that Jesus gives us of God wanting to shelter us the way a mother hen shelters her chicks. Jesus has that way of simultaneously challenging us and comforting us. We are challenged to live in God's love, and that means taking risks and doing things we might not want to do. But it also means rejoicing and celebrating in the depth of God's love. And it means recognizing that God does do new things. God delivered the people from slavery in Egypt and brought them to that mountain to begin a new thing to shape the nation of Israel, to be an example to all the nations of the earth. And God did a new thing when the people of Israel said, hey, we want to be like everyone else and have a king. And God said, not a good idea. But God was willing to work with the people to meet them where they were at, and the monarchy of Israel was established. And God continued to do a new thing as wars and rebellions took place and the people were sent into exile and God sent prophets to remind the people of the challenges of being God's people and the promise of being God's people. And God did a new thing in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus proving once and for all that death does not have the last word. And God did a new thing by sending out apostles to all the ends of the known world to bring that news of God's love to everyone, not just to the people of Israel. And God did a new thing when this new Christianity was persecuted. God kept it safe in the midst of persecutions. 
And then God did a new thing when the emperor of Rome said, hey, let's make this the official religion. And those were, there were more challenges with that. And God continues to do new things through the centuries, through bishops and popes and missionaries, through a rebellious monk and the printing press in 1500s. God continues to do new things. And we are at the brink of another new thing. We all know that church is not like the way it was when we were little children. And we don't know what church is going to be like for the next generations. But we do know that God is faithful. We do know that God continually does these new things and that God's love and faithfulness is constant. We are at the brink of something new and no one can claim to know what that looks like. But we do know that God will be present. And in the meanwhile, in today and tomorrow, we continue to live as the people of God. In today and tomorrow, we seek to be faithful we read the scriptures, we pray, we look out over the world to see where God is at work and how we can help that work. Today and tomorrow we are called to live as the people of God, confident that on the third day, in whatever new thing God is doing, God's love is present. We tend to the task of today and tomorrow as we go on our journey. Even as we know that we don't know exactly where the journey is leading us, we know who is leading us. God is with us today and tomorrow. And on the third day, God's goal will be met and all of creation will be healed. We journey today and tomorrow with more questions than answers, but knowing that God's love surrounds us and shelters us and protects us today and tomorrow, trusting in the third day.
Please stand and let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Each prayer petition will end with the phrase, Lord, in your mercy, respond, hear our prayer. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. You gather the church into a community of mercy and grace. Unify Christians around the globe in efforts to proclaim good news even in the face of opposition, and to protect those whose lives are imperiled by the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. You create the entire universe and call it good. Hinder those who would cause further destruction to our planet's fragile ecosystems, and augment the calls of those who advocate for thoughtful stewardship of the Earth's resources. Lord, in your mercy. You raise up leaders committed to love and justice. Nurture in those who govern patience to receive criticism, openness to new ideas, and courage to change course when needed for the sake of the common good. Help bring justice and peace to Ukraine. Be with Bishop Jerzy Szomagik of our Companion Synod in Poland and with our sister congregation, Les Anglais, in Haiti. Lord, in your mercy. You hear us when we cry to you. Attend to those expecting a child and console those who have experienced miscarriage. Comfort veterans enduring post-traumatic stress. Shield those endangered by domestic violence. Give aid to refugees. Uphold those who are ill or grieving, especially Bob, Marianne, Maggie, Bonnie, and those we now name out loud or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. You kindle faith that moves us into action. Guide the efforts of organizations that work for justice. Empower the ethnic, specific, and multicultural ministries of the ELCA. Give us all a renewed sense of vocation. Lord, in your mercy. You welcome us into your heavenly realm. We give thanks for those whose labors on earth are ended and who now rest with you. On the final day, Gather all of us with them into your loving arms. Lord, in your mercy. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be, here, may be seated. 
And I invite you at this time, if you have brought lotion or oil, to uh, get ready for the healing ritual, for those at home to get some oil or lotion for yourselves. Our Lord Jesus healed many as a sign of the reign of God come near and sent the disciples to continue this work of healing with prayer, the laying on of hands, and anointing. In the name of Christ, the great healer and reconciler of the world, we now entrust to God all who are in need of healing. Let us pray. Loving God, your son Jesus brought healing and wholeness to all. Bring your healing presence now to all who are sick or in pain. Grant hope to all who are discouraged or in despair. Mend broken relationships and bring peace to families, this community, our nation, and the world. Amen. This time I invite you to take oil or lotion or whatever you have. If you're with someone, you can make the sign of the cross on one of the other's foreheads, or you can make it on your own forehead or on the palm of your hand or the back of your hand. Do this anointing in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who brings wholeness and peace and comfort to all. Let us pray. Living God, through this anointing, grant comfort and suffering to all who are in need of healing. When they are afraid, give them courage. When afflicted, give them patience. When dejected, give them hope. And when alone, assure them of the support of your holy people. We ask this through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. As we consider how our whole lives are worship and an offering to God, remember again that includes how we use our finances. Remember that offerings given to the, uh, our Savior's Lutheran Church, a portion of that are sent on to the Synod, which goes to, uh, and more of that goes to the ELCA. One of the things that the ELCA does is administer funds like the Lutheran Disaster Response. Because we support the ELCA, that means that anyone who gives through the Lutheran disaster response, 100% of that gift goes directly to the people who are affected by that disaster. So given to this church, in a way, help makes it possible for disaster response to go without any administrative costs. Let us pray. Extravagant God, you have blessed us with the fullness of creation. Take and use what we offer here. Come among us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We sing the sending song. Please stand.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way. Thanks. Thanks.